Hello, good morning. Thanks for choosing us on our news desk this morning. Performance contract of Strategic Mobilization Limited with GRE suspended as President directs a thorough probe into the $100 million deal after expose by Fourth Estate. Also coming up, we have a breakdown of Ghana's debt restructuring processes and some effects it has had on the economy. My name is Daryl Kwao. Please stay tuned. Expansion was directed... And first up, the performance contract between local companies, Strategic Mobilization Ghana Limited, SML, and the Ghana Revenue Authority has been uh, suspended by President Kufado indefinitely. Not only that, a full-scale audit with immediate effect will be launched into the deal by KPMG, a private audit tax and advisory services firm. This follows a documentary titled The Three Billion CD Live by the Fourth Estate, alleging a $100 million annual contract awarded to SML by the Finance Ministry for monitoring the petroleum industry, which is not only duplication but does not contribute revenue savings. SML denies the accuracy of this information in the documentary, asserting it has not yet operationalized the contract. Here's a wrap from the investigation. These comments follow a documentary titled The Three Billion CD Lie by the Fort Estate alleging that the finance ministry ordered an expansion of the SML contract for 10 years, estimating it could yield the company $100 million annually. The documentary also claims that the expansion was directed despite the company making false claims about its savings through revenue assurance in the downstream sector. The GRA had backed SML's initial claim that it saved Ghana more than 3 billion cities. The GRA backing comes despite the MD of the company, Christian Soti, denying the company saved the state that much. That's why that's, why, that's $3 billion, uh, 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 I'm not. That's why I told you from the beginning. I said I don't know about this $3 billion. We cannot say your intervention saved $3 billion. That's, no, I said $3 billion. I'm not, if I, I've told you that I'm not aware. Because when we were told about the publication, we even called the... As we speak this morning, still on your website, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, fact, to be honest, me, I don't even know uh, website matter. Within SML itself, there are contradictions on this subject of the three billion CD savings. This week, head of IT, Prince Sapong, contradicted publicly his boss. So, in estimate, what actually happened with the, the three billion is, as I talked about, the money is all about the volumes. So, if there's an increase in volume, there's an increase in revenue. And since SML started operation, we can confidently say that there has been an average monthly increase of 100 million liters. So if you multiply it by 24 months with the tax component that we are not even using the 1.74, we are using the old tax component, which is 1.44, that will arrive at the 3 billion that we talked about. This current position of the head of IT contradicts his own earlier assertions when the fourth estates first put the question to himself and his boss during the investigations. What we did was not even the accurate figure. We, were never, we never talked about accurate because we are not GRE. Only GRE can give you accurate figure. So when we are talking about this, it depends on how it was reported. So it didn't, uh, no one actually said that uh, we actually generated as, as like accurate age. Yes. So they say there's a caption by a journalist. The problem. The GRE claims in a statement that SML is only paid if there is value addition. However, the contract specifies that SML is not required to add value to the upstream petroleum and gold sectors. It will be paid as long as production takes place. Receiving 0.75 cents per barrel of the 160,000 barrels of oil Ghana produces daily. Additionally, SML will receive 0.75% of the total gold production, amounting to about $50 million annually, based on 2022 gold production figures. The GRA claims they signed a five-year contract, but the Fort Estate says the contract they referred to had a 10-year agreement and may have been updated 
Listen to lead investigator Manasi Azuri Awuni. Some documents which I'm also sharing, uh, I think page 13 of the 54 page contract mentioned 10 years. If they have reviewed it to five years, we requested documents officially from them, they have not responded to us. But if they have reviewed it, it doesn't change the fact that for the next five years, SML will be making more than 100 million US dollars. So that was a wrap of the documentary by Fourth Estate. We have for you a breakdown of the president's directive on your screens in a bit. It says the president of the republic, Nana Dudan Kwekufado, has appointed KPMG, the reputable audit tax and advisory services firm, to conduct an immediate audit into the transaction between the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA, and Strategic Mobilization Ghana Limited, SML, a contract which was entered into uh, to enhance revenue assurance in the downstream petroleum sector, the upstream petroleum production and minerals and metals resources value chain. Goes on to say, uh, talk about the terms of reference of the audit, uh, conduct an audit to ascertain the rationale or needs assessment performed prior to the contract approval by GRA and assess how the ar arrangement aligns with specific needs. Also assess the appropriateness of the contract methodology, verifying compliance with legal standards and industry best practices in the procurement process for the selection of SML. Evaluate the degree of alignment between current activities and the stipulated contract scope, identifying any deviations. Evaluate the value or benefit that SML has so far offered to the GRA through this engagement. Review the financial arrangements, including pricing structures, payment terms, and resolution of any financial compliance issues. And submit a report on your findings on the above together with appropriate recommendations. President Ekufado has tasked KPMG to complete the assignment in two weeks and submit appropriate recommendations to him. The President has directed the Ministry of Finance and GRA to provide KPMG with whatever assistance they will require for conduct of the audit and has also directed the Ministry of Finance and the Ghana Revenue Authority to suspend the performance of the contract pending the submission of the audit report, including any payments presently envisaged under its terms. My colleague, Samuel Mbura, who has been following the story, joins me now uh, with a reaction to the president's statement. Uh, Samuel, we know the minority has reacted to this. What are they saying? Well, the minority um, in a statement yesterday indicated that the directive by the president has arrived late because parliament has already constituted a committee to look into this agreement. So it is not going to make any difference so far as this investigation is concerned. The thing that the president is trying to fight, wash this whole investigation, citing antecedents of um, uh, investigations sanctioned by the president, which did not yield the expected results. How about uh, civil society organizations? Well, the first reaction came from Vice um, President of Imani Africa, uh, Bright Simmons. He says that the terms of reference do not extend to forensic examination of the procurement abuses, uh, that is the single sourcing of an unqualified entity, nor of the technology uh, system purported to have been created for the job. He is of the firm belief that there should be a detailed concurrent review by the OSB and Shraj into this issue. And we also have got a reaction from the fourth estate. Can you share that with us? Well, the fourth estate um, is uh, of the firm conviction that the evidence they have produced so far uh, regarding their investigations are enough for prosecution. Uh, the work that KMP, uh, KPMG is supposed to do within three weeks may not be able to arrive at any um, reasonable conclusion uh, into the matter because they think that the time limit uh, is not enough or the time is not enough for them to carry out. And what they have, if the president wa really wants to prosecute, um, they have the evidence to back the investigations for all those found culpable to be prosecuted. Join us, journalist Samuel Imbura, following uh, this story for us. Thank you so much uh, for joining us with that.
Abid uh, Kwame Janto is a private legal practitioner. He joins us on phone. Uh, good, morning to, good morning to you, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to pick your thoughts on the latest developments to do with this uh, SML uh, contract, the fact that the president has suspended uh, the deal. Okay, good morning and uh, Happy New Year to you all. The first question I, 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 I asked myself when I saw uh, the letter was that, is the president trying to tell us that from the word go, he wasn't aware of this ML, SML contract? When you consider that nearly 90 members of his party went to the president to tell him to uh, sack uh, Kenoforiata, and he did not allow, it goes to show that there is a strong bond between the president and the finance minister. And you're trying to tell us that the president knew nothing about it from the word go, and he's just hearing about it. Is what trying to tell us? Number two, KPMG. Do they not recruit for GRA? Find out. Go to your homework and find out. Whether they have a relationship with GRA, is that not a conflict of interest? Within GRA, they have commissioners and commissioner generals. Are you telling me that uh, GRA do not have the right people to handle this particular uh, 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 probe? And then you ask yourself a question. In 2016-2017, Finance Ministry bought McKenzie to try and do what? Help uh, uh, GRA increase their revenues because they indicated that uh, McKenzie had done good work in East Africa. Have we had a report from McKenzie? And what McKenzie got in there, what happened? How much money have they paid McKenzie to date with regards to that work that they were asked to do? Has that question been answered? Do we know? And then you ask GRA, and GRA will say to you, this particular SML deal was imposed on GRA. There are competent people within GRA to do what? To do this work. And when you look at when the finance minister came in, didn't he take a set of GRA commissioners out and brought the uh, is it Amisha Dai uh, 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 group in? And when that Amisha Dai group was brought in, the targets of GRA, was that not reduced? Go and find out. I think it was reduced about $5 billion for them to, to, to make the target because the, the, he realized that if they weren't able to achieve uh, the target, then it meant that the people that they're taking out, there was no need for them to have taken them out from the word go. So there's more to it than meets the eye. And Parliament says they are going to what? They are going to investigate. I think Shraj should also investigate. All the bodies that are is linked with this. We, we see that, you know, this particular contract is not a contract that is transparent. We should get all these bodies to go into it. Why KPMG? Why? Why KPMG? Let's ask a question. Do they have the world with all to do it? Do they have a relationship with government? Is there any conflict of interest there with KPMG, you know, coming in? Let those questions be asked. And let's be clear about this. But the president cannot tell me that really and truly, from the word go, he knew nothing about it. So why has it taken this long for him to say that, okay, let's suspend? What kind of discussions have gone on? Because the president and King Kukoyata are mm. bonded. So please, let's give ourselves a break. Yes, he's been suspended. Let's see what has also come out. Let Parliament do its own. Let's see what has also come out of that. Let GRA itself do its own. And let's see what will come out. And let's see. There's yeah. that will come out if it's on the same line. I mean, it's not just you raising concern about the choice of KPMG uh, to do the audit. Uh, we've got civil society organizations also raising uh, those concerns. But the question also comes up uh, about how equipped our institutions are, other institutions are, uh, in, in looking into this contract, really? Well, if you're looking for institutions, for me, I think Shiraj is well equipped to look at this. The Auditor General is well equipped to look at this. The uh, security services, they are well equipped to look at this. 
if there is an element of corruption in this thing, I would even say that the, uh, the, the special prosecutor is also equipped to look at this. Mm. But the question should be asked, why has it taken the president this long to put this in place? When the whole Ferrari started, why didn't he step in? You can't tell me that he knew nothing about it. I find it difficult. That bit I find very difficult to accept. What kind of discussions have now gone on between the finance ministry, Kenofuriata, and the president for the president to now say, okay, KPMG, go into it? He didn't hear people talk about it. He didn't hear on the news what was being said when it started. That was when he should have stepped in. So the question is, why now? Yes, it's better late than never. But what will the end result be? Let's hope the end result is positive. Because looking at the trajectory, Every Tom, Dick, and Kweku who has looked at this thing is saying that there is a smelly fish in there somewhere. Well, just wondering though, given the concerns raised by uh, Ben Boachi regarding a potential conflict of interest, how uh, should KPMG address the perception that its integrity might be at stake, especially considering its status as uh, a client of GRA and the sensitivity of investigating leaders within one of his large portfolios, which has been described as um, exceedingly suspicious and unethical? I would say, if KPMG, for any reason, for any fathom, for any iota, if they feel there is a conflict of interest with the work they do with government where this is concerned, they should withdraw. Mm. They should withdraw. They should say, yes, it is something that we can do. We have all the tools and uh, all the people and, you know, technical people to do it. However, we work for government in one, two, three, four, five areas. So, Mr. President, unfortunately, you have to withdraw from this. Find someone else. If it so happens that, if it so happens that they, are, they don't have any business with government where GR is concerned, where they feel that you know, there could be no conflict of interest, then they should go ahead. But if there is an iota of conflict of interest in what they are going to do, they should withdraw. They should withdraw. Because it is, you know, the money you're talking about, no chicken feed. The monies are no chicken feed. And you have the institutions. You have MCA, you have Petroleum Commission, you have uh, 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 the, 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 the Minerals Commission, who are regulators, who are supposed to do this job. And let me ask you a question. Where SML is concerned, has a risk assessment been done of SML so far? Has it? Maybe with the, uh, the, 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 the terms of reference that have been given them. Let's hope that can be done. And I would have loved a situation, eh, for transparency's sake, all the what you call it who be called, it should be televised. It should be televised. KPMG should televise it. All the people they are going to call to interview, it should be televised. If we want transparency. We don't want a situation where they now come and tell us, oh, eh, this is what we found, the da 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 and case closed. No. It should be televised. Okay. Um, I, I want us to take a look. I don't know if KPMG would eventually pull out, but I want us to take a look at the, the scope of the audit and the terms uh, provided, whether they are exhaustive enough, because Bright uh, Simmons, for instance, insists the terms of reference do not um, extend to a forensic examination of the procurement abuses, uh, nor of the technology system purported to have, created, uh, to have been created for the job. You mean the terms of reference that has been given uh, KPMG? KPMG by the president. By the government? Yeah. It says conduct an audit to ascertain the rationale or needs assessment performance prior to the, appro prior to the contract approval by GRA and assess how the arrangement aligns with specific needs assess the appropriateness of the contracting methodology, verifying compliance with legal standards and industry best practices in the procurement process of the selection of SML. Let me ask the question. From the word go, when SML was brought in, was this not done? 
Please just even take that number one bit of the terms of reference. Are you trying to tell me that from the word go, when SML was taught off, this particular terms of reference wasn't done? And that after it has been in place for, what, two, three years, we are now going to do it? Is that what you're trying to tell me? And that is where I find a question with the terms of reference. So before you brought the company in, you didn't look to see whether they have the wherewithal to do the job and what is required. And you didn't actually even go to the stakeholders, the regulators, to say, look, guys, this is what we are experiencing. Petroleum Commission, MPA, and uh, the, the, the National uh, 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 Minerals Commission, the, the Minerals Commission, let's sit around the table. This is what we realize. And because we realize this, this is what we are suggesting. Do we have the wherewithal to do it? And let me ask a question. A certain amount of money is paid to uh, uh, the GRA. I think it's about, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's about 300 CDs. I'm not too sure. But the finance ministry could have gone to parliament and said to parliament, this amount of money that is being taken by GRA, please increase it by 100 CDs to about 400. That 100 CD uh, difference that is in there, we can use it to do this kind of job that SML is doing because GRA has competent people to do this job. That is what I don't understand. If GRA, uh, uh, they don't have the people to do it. You have, you have commissioners and commissioner generals in the GRA who have been there. Are you trying to tell me they would not be able to do this job? Is that what you're trying to tell me? And so it makes it a bit, mm, you ask yourself, when you really delve down into it, you, you ask yourself, do they not have the wherewithal to do it? Is that what we're saying? So let the investigation come out. And let's see what comes out. I'm going to get it then when it comes out. Is that what going parliament, to be? parliament is going to do its own? Yes. Let's see whether it aligns with parliament. I think GRA should also do their own. If, if possible, if possible, the Public Services Commission should do their own. And then hopefully, hopefully, Shraj, somebody will take it to Shraj, and let Shraj also do his own. And let's see whether the end results align. And if they align, some of us will eat humble pie mm -hmm. and say we were wrong. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, there's plenty to talk about in the coming days. Uh, Kwame Jantua is a private legal practitioner. I appreciate your time. Well, moving on, in a pivotal economic development for Ghana, the nation has undertaken a comprehensive debt restructuring initiative to establish financial sustainability. Now, this imperative measure was driven by the need to secure a $3 billion extended credit facility from the International Monetary Fund. The initial phase involved domestic debt restructuring, entailing the exchange of existing domestic bonds for new ones. Notably, the nation successfully um, obtained finance and assurances from its external creditors, facilitating the disbursement of the first tranche of the IMF loan on May 17, 2023. Ghana is currently expecting the disbursement of the second tranche of the loan facility, but faces a challenge of getting some specific agreement from its external creditors as demanded by the IMF. Well, in studio is um, Isaac Ophiaji with a breakdown of um, Ghana's debt restructuring processes and some of the effects it has had on the economy. Uh, happy to have you in studio. So where do we begin from, Kofi? Uh, well, let's start from the domestic debt exchange program. At least that is the one that we can boldly say that has been concluded according to the finance has it been? minister. So the finance minister, when he was reading the 2024 budget, mm -hmm. made it clear that the DDP has been concluded and we are basing on that statement to say that we can successfully or we can confidently say that the DDP has been concluded. Uh, but we also know that in the memorandum of understanding that governs the domestic debt exchange program, mm. there is a portion in that MOU that states that, I mean, we may have different levels of exchange. And therefore, there were certain instruments that were actually excluded from the domestic debt exchange program, but may be subject to um, you know, future exchanges. So it's, we, they talk about the you know, treasury bills, which are currently not part of the DDP, but 
if you read the MOU well. Remember some time ago we were told they're, they're absolutely not going to be touched, right? Mm -hmm. The yes. T-bills. Yes. Okay. But in the MOU... Just reminding us. <laughs> in the MOU, you have it in there. So we have a list for you, um, the domestic debt exchange program and the amount that was exchanged, looking at the various types of institutions that uh, took part in the exchange program. So we have the first leg of the DDP. Mind you, the DDP went through... Uh, if we see at least about three rounds, we look at the first leg mm -hmm. that exchanged about 87 billion Ghana cities. Then we had the second round that called pension funds and other, you know, uh, um, bondholders to come on board. That, that was a tough one, wasn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, that was a very tough one. The third one that the finance ministry referred to as the DDP reopening, we saw that most of the, the you know, the agents were not willing to participate in that very one. And we also know that foreigners who bought local bonds with foreign currency were also asked to exchange their monies. About $742 million were exchanged. So you have all the various participation rates displayed on the screen for you to know. Um, the highest uh, form of participation rate was the one we saw at the Bank of Ghana level where they participated about 100% suffered a haircut of 50%, mm. where Bank of Ghana lost significant amount of money, more than 60 billion Ghana cities. Which that became was very topical, very topical um, in, in the latter part yeah, of 2023. Absolutely. But we are looking at the effects of the DDP and we are asking ourselves a question of, if the finance minister says it is over, is it really over? Mind you, the debt restructuring we are doing is not only at the domestic level, but we are also doing it at the external level as well. Uh, where currently we've not been able to assemble the needed financial assurances from our creditors to be able to, uh, you know, trigger the release of the second tranche of the IMF money. So on your screens right now is the estimated losses of the DDP, uh, you know, uh, as a result of the, both the first and second round of the DDP that we had. But one thing that the DDP has done mm -hmm. is that it has actually changed the scope of you know our financial system where currently commercial banks are now chasing after you know um, shorter securities which is the treasury bills so currently government is in the market you know competing with private entities for funds in the private space which is also problematic which is very problematic and that's what the ddp has done because first government had access to bonds markets and treasury bill markets. So they were complementing each other. But because of the DDP, you've eventually um, actually, you know, taken away the bonds market. You have no access to the bonds market at the local level and then also at the external level. So what is happening is that government is going all out into the treasury bill space to borrow significantly. And we Card see- Harden out the private absolutely. sector. Absolutely. Every week we see significant amounts of monies in billion Ghana cities being borrowed. And you ask yourself, this is the same money that private people are supposed to also get access to. So what is happening is that because of the DDP that government did and the kind of, um, you know, risks that was actually attached to mm. money being lended to government. Now, government will have to now increase the, the interest rates of T-bills so that it becomes attractive for the banks to come and buy. Uh, just so our audience can mm. appreciate this better, I mean, today we run a story about yeah. government... Uh, Borrowing six percent more from T bills uh, than it, in December than it did in November. in November, so it keeps increasing. It keeps increasing, and it's in the budget. Government is, would have to fund a budget deficit of more than sixty billion Ghana cedis, and you ask yourself, how are they going to do it? They state in the budget that they are going to fund everything from the domestic space, and from the domestic space, you had access to two markets. One has been collapsed as a result of your DDP, and so it means that government is, is going to go all out mm -hmm. in the treasury bill space to borrow that amount of money to fund the, the, the current deficit that we have. And if you do that, then it means you are pricing out the private sector. And that's why if you look at the monetary policy report of the Bank of Ghana, it says that, you know, the private funds to the private sector or credits to the private sector actually contracted by some 7.5% in October last year than it grew by more than 57% you know, uh, in uh, October last last two years. So you had in 2022, 
funds to the private sector growing by 57.3%. Mm. Then all of a sudden, you come to the same period in October, contracting by 7.5%. And Bank of Ghana made it clear that this is because banks are now running after shorter instruments. So they are buying the 91-day treasury bills because they want to make money. They see it to be very attractive. 31%, 30%, banks will go out and buy all of these treasury bills. And if you are doing that, once the T-bill rate is high, it also means that banks cannot lend below that, you know, that T-bill rate. Right. They will keep their lending rate above that. So when the private person also goes to the bank to borrow, you have interest rate being quoted around 33%, even some at 40%. And those who are doing the, the varied interest rates, you take the loan at 33%. By the time you are done repaying the loan, you are looking around 40%. And so the private sector is being crowded out on both angles. Where you go, there are high you know, interest for you to pay. And two, you are not getting access to the funds because the, the big guy, which is government, is already in the space borrowing so much. Well, let's give the government the benefit of the doubt. I mean, when it comes to sourcing of money, mm. it's challenged right now. Absolutely. The international capital market is, is a no-go area, mm. at least for now. So how do they get money? They have to turn to the But well, how do market. they get money? One way is that go and talk to your external creditors. And this brings us to the external debt restructuring. Go and have a negotiation with your external creditors. They're trying to do that, I think. So they, <laughs> so they give you the needed assurances for you to have additional funds. This time around, it's not going to be in CDs. It's going to be in dollars. Mm. When you are able to do that, you get $600 million. And because government has put itself in a very, very difficult situation, asking private commercial creditors to suffer a haircut of up to 40%. Mm. Mind you, Daryl, that those who bought our external bonds or those that we went to do the roadshow in the 2021s when we were the trailblazers in 2021, 2020, those people that we bought the bonds from are not the same people holding the bonds right now. The blue chip investors, they sold the bonds to now people who are ready to hold the bonds to the dying embers of whatever restructuring talks you want to bring. So they are ready. They already bought the bonds knowing the kind of risks that is attached to it. And so having negotiation with these people is going to prove difficult. That is at, at the commercial side. Now, when you go to the bilateral side, you are mm -hmm. having difficulty with two big giants coming to the negotiation table for you to have you know, talks with. There's China, which hardly will forgive you of your debts. There's China, exactly. which will tell you that during restructuring, because the loan I give you is interest-related, I will either extend the maturity period or you increase the interest, your, 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 your coupon rate. And that's not what we are willing which, to do Which right looks now. like the more likely option. The more likely option, which we are not probably ready because that will not give you the needed financing assurance that you need it means you are going to just push all your debts to you know the next three years or the next four years and you may end up paying more we saw the same thing happening to congo when they went to china for restructuring they initially went for a hundred percent write-off china said no hmm. what we can do for you at best is extend the maturity period and also increase the coupon rate. What happened is that at the time that Congo was supposed to pay that debt, they ended up paying more than they were supposed to pay two years or three years ago. And that is the kind of strategy that China will bring to the negotiation table. And so you have all the other bilateral guys saying, talk to China first. Talk to China first. Let us know the kind of arrangement you have with China, especially when you have almost all your collateralized loans with China, which... In the case when you default, some of them, China may have access to revenues from your, 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 your gold, your bauxite, and even sales from electricity. Mm. Those were some of the contracts we signed with China. That when we default, you can have access to these things. And so the other guys are watching because when, you, when we all go, come for a restructuring, we are hoping that you sell your gold your oil, your bauxite, in the near future for you to pay all of us. And if one person has access to them, how are you going to generate the needed um, foreign exchange to pay all of us? So these are some of the dynamics 
that are playing out at the external level in terms of the debt restructuring. So That's at the domestic tough, level, of course, mm. uh, I mean, we're looking at the January 11 date for yeah. the second uh, meeting on Ghana. The executive at, board? Yeah, mm -hmm. of the IMF. And looking at the way things are going, I doubt that would happen with it. Well, in fact, if you doubt that, then if you look at <laughs> the, the timelines we set for our own selves, the first one, the original one that is in the IMF program, which was supposed to be November 1, 2023. We missed that one because, I mean, we were not able to get the needed finance and assurance. Then we went ahead to say, by the dying embers of November, we are going to get it. We couldn't get that. that we said December, we didn't get that. Now we are saying first half, first quarter of 2024. We are three days into the year. Let's hope and see what governments can do. <laughs> but one thing that is going to be difficult is that you are asking Eurobond creditors to suffer a haircut of 40%. You are not the only person seeking for debt relief from creditors like that. So everybody is watching what the Eurobond guys would do for Ghana. So if you are able to give Ghana 40% haircut, then Zambia will also comfortably come and say, can you give us a haircut of 40%? Mm. And they are looking at all of these things they are being very circumspect with, with respect to the restructuring talks with Ghana. Maybe not all the things that are in the proposal that will come out, but the magnitude of haircut would determine the future negotiations with other countries. And that's why they are being, being very, very careful. And then also they know this year is an election year. And if you give government the needed fiscal space, they will abuse it. And so everybody is being very, Setting very, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are looking at what they can do. So if they are supposed to give you breathing, fiscal breathing space of, let's say, two billion in one year, they will give it to you in tranches so that they know if they give all to you, there is a high likelihood that you can abuse that money and the needed, you know, um, impact that it can have on your economy, you may not be able to get it. And I'm sure that's the reason why the IMF was very insistent that, we should get our debt levels to sustainable levels and they tie that to the disbursement. So right now, we have an IMF program all right, but the actual disbursement is hinged on we having positive or successful restructuring talks with our creditors. Yeah, I mean, how, how, is, how is this all having an impact on the economy? I know that uh, recently the government has touted uh, economic recovery, saying we are turning the corner and all of that. Yeah. But how has DDP impacted the economy? Well, first, we have to talk about inflation. You know, inflation has actually come down to a very significant level from more than 50% in 2023, December mm. 2023, to the level we have right now. But you may not be able to feel it because government is still borrowing at 31%, 33%, 32% from the T-bill market. And if government is doing that, you can have inflation as low as 7%, but nobody will feel the impact because banks cannot come down below the treasury bill rate to borrow to the private person at 16% or 17%. So until we have T-bill rates coming down at the same rate as inflation is coming down, there is no way we are going to benefit from the inflation value we are seeing. It can only be a textbook figure. But once we are able to um, you know, have the same you know, T-bill rates, and inflation rates coming down at the same level, government borrowing at 13% or 14% or 17%, then banks can now comfortably borrow, lend money to people at 20% or 22%. And that financial burden on private people, on businesses, will now come down. So two things, mm -hmm. inflation is coming down, but because of government activities in the T-bill market, it will be very, very difficult for economic agents to feel it. And already we say, oh, the city suffered a depreciation of 15% in the entire 2023. But that's still very significant. People are still exchanging dollar to city for about 11 to 12 cities. And that's, that's huge. I mean, if you look at all of those things compared to the inflation rates and all of those, and then it becomes very difficult for, for people to feel the real impact of the IMF program. You may have the money all right. You may have all the economic indicators GDP growing at 3%, 4%. But if you are not able to get banks lending to private people at very, very low rates, you definitely won't feel 
the impact in the economic space. You're genius. <laughs> Isaac Opeje <laughs> is a senior data Thank analyst you. that joined yeah. us. Thank you so much for your time on Newsdesk. Uh, you're watching Newsdesk. We're taking a break. When we come back, we have some more stories for you. Welcome back to the news. Now, the General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Justin Frimpong-Kodia, recently encouraged the ministers, CEOs, and MMDCEs who are fatigued to consider resigning rather than undermine the party's progress. And his concern about the conduct of certain appointees whose actions affect the party's popularity, Kodia said, quote, if you're tired, resign and leave so part the party can retain power. My colleague, uh, Kenneth JC, has been engaging the public on this statement. Not long ago, the General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, John Buedu, came out to say that if you're a Minister of State and you think you're tired, kindly resign from a Kufuado's government. We're in the streets once again to find out from Ghanaians which minister they think is tired and should resign. You're live on Joy News. Yeah, good morning. My name is Apostle Michael. Right. Which minister do you think is tired and should resign and why? The road minister and the finance minister must go. I believe they have performed abysmal to my best of interest, and I don't think they are supposed to hold on their portfolios. With the finance minister, we could see the loops, even pensioners who have served and on retirement, who have dipped in their hands and their monies to reform financial sector in Ghana. It's wrong. With the road minister, you shut down the two boots that can give you a little money to repair some roads. And now we have manholes and gallipers in our road. In these perceptions, I think they have failed woefully, and they have to go. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me come to you as well. Which minister do you think is tired and should resign? Uh, thank you very much. My name is Bukari Mbangiba. Uh, I personally don't want to single out a minister and say you should resign. But this goes to all the ministers. If you know you have been given the ministerial position and you are not performing up to your expectation, you should consider the masses, the suffering of Ghanaians, and the sake of God, and then you resign for somebody to come in and do the work well to bring relief to Ghanaians. Look at the way we are suffering. People are suffering. How to even meet a daily square meal is a problem. So somebody shouldn't pick up the position and it's not performing and it's affecting us. The president, before the appointment of the ministers, said he is not appointing them to come and amass wealth. Or he is not appointing them to pick up the positions and they are not performing and think that it is a position or it's an opportunity to make money. Right. If you know you are not performing, it's as simple as that. You don't need somebody to come in and tell you that resign. You have to resign yourself. You look at, assess yourself. You have self-assessment. You assess yourself and if you see that you are not even meeting half of your target, you just resign and somebody comes in. There are a lot of people, a lot of Ghanaians are ready to work. So I think that those who are not performing, those ministers who are not performing, uh, they should look at the sufferings of Ghanaians. They should consider that and then resign for those who are ready to perform to come in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, if my cameraman could uh, you know, move forward a bit, we, 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 we would want to find out from other people on the street also who they think should resign. Uh, remember last year, the Minister for Agric, Dr. Efri Yakuto, resigned uh, to go contest for president. And also Alan Chamatin, the long-serving trade minister, would resign to contest uh, for president in the New Patriotic Party and resign to form his own political party. Daddy, good morning. Good morning. But you all join you. So. Uh, ministers are Omobano. Ministers are Kufuado ministers. That's it. So he's also uh, mentioning Moses Enim to resign because according to him, he's also the member of parliament for his constituency and he has never heard him utter a word in parliament. 
nor has he seen him in his constituency since he was voted for. Uh, which minister do you think is not performing that you feel should resign? Uh, to me, like the real minister. Why? Because a lot of Ghana right now, a lot of our roads are bad. If you look at the Pukwasi road right now, they started this road not long ago. Like, and we are in election year now. This road will be there uh, during this election. They will come and do some reshuffle, this thing, then say the road is. Meanwhile, within two, three years, then you see that the road is bad again. So to me, the road minister is one, education minister is two. Our education system right now, trust me, you know, I don't have to tell you. Right now, we don't even know our education system right now. Everything is bad. Schools are under trees. There's no infrastructure. A, a, a whole lot. There's free SHS. Oh, Basu, Basu. To me, the free SHS, I won't say it is bad and I won't say it's good. Is that both the advantage and disadvantage? You know, in everything, we have the. I always say, say our leaders, say, sometimes if you are doing that, they, they need to sit down and plan well. Because, boss, trust me, if you don't plan, you do the thing uh, later on, you realize that what you did is cost 90. So uh, you, you've heard the views, opinions of people on the streets, what they think, which minister they think should resign. I mean, some have mentioned uh, about one or two ministers they feel should resign. Others have also said that they have no idea about which minister supervises which uh, ministry. So uh, live from Circle in Accra, I'm Kenneth Jesse, back to you in the studio. Well, let's do some sports now. The Black Stars of Ghana will be aiming to end the 42-year African Cup of Nations drought at the upcoming tournament in Ivory Coast. Ghana is one of the 24 countries set to compete for glory in the 2024 AFCON tournament. An official squad announcement on Monday, January 1, uh, 2024, confirms that key players like Thomas Partey and Abdul Baba Rahman will miss the tournament. With the release of the 27-man squad, uh, some Ghanaians have shared their views on what they think the prospects of the Ghana Black Stars are as the tournament approaches. Have you know equally good players? Kudus, Jordan, and the other players—they are all equally good. And, you know, and they are young. They are, you know, it's youth team too. So I hope you know we can. They can do better. We have a good quality team, but um, um, the team is not ready to come together to, uh, to win in the cup now. I think maybe in the, in the next um, two or five years before. But for now, I, I don't think we can. We can reach semi-final or, uh, like, I mean, quarter-final. Yeah, because this squad, like, I mean, this Blaster squad is not squad for trophy. But the squad we caught now no, is, uh, they are the best for the coach. We have the heart, but for now, uh, how these people are doing, you know, Ghana is like how they start this, uh, this Asantua, this thing, you know, people will not follow Ghanaians especially, they only back you when they see you going, and you see this, this, this uh, gun match will lose, and because of that, uh, we don't have the vim to back up Ghana, the heart to back up Ghana. And Ghana is always in victory when we are backing Ghana with our heart. And for this time, we don't have the heart to back up Ghana. But I know that surely we have victory. I don't see any future in this Blast House team because the coach, he's the head coach, but he, he doesn't have the mandate to do what he likes. They have been calling players for him on his behalf even Recently, look at some mistakes that's did. We will go, but we will come out from the group stage. I'm not sure Ghana will be able to reach quarter final because this team and the way they are playing. Oh no, nah. I've lost interest in Blasters for a very long time because it's very boring to go and sit down to watch Blasters match. Like I used to watch Chelsea women's football, just like those days. They will go, they will hype. We will support, nothing will come out. So for me, I've stopped supporting Blaster because it's just a waste of time and stress. Okay, welcome. All right, you're watching News Desk. We are taking a short break. We'll be right back.
And before we go, we want to take you to Tamale, where um, Ghanaian chef Faila Abdurazak has been cooking for 58 hours and counting in her attempt to break the Guinness World Record. She's been cooking for 58 hours, can you imagine? Well, it commenced uh, on midnight, that's uh, January 1, and she's been cooking. She's, been ho she's hoping to do this for the next uh, five days, so hopefully it ends on the 5th of January. Um, so those are visuals from Tamale where Fila is attempting to break the Guinness World Record. I don't know if there's any sound to it. who uh, thong the, the premises uh, are getting to eat for free, I guess. Uh, so we are wishing Fyla all the best as she attempts to break the Guinness World Record. There is more news on our website, myjoyonline.com. Uh, you can find our top story for this morning, Kufado orders audit into GRA SML contract. You can read more about that on our website, myjoyonline.com. Plus, we've got a live stream of day three of uh, Filer's attempt to uh, break uh, the Guinness World Record in a cooking marathon by joyonline.com. My name is Daryl Carr. Thanks for watching. Keep it here on Joy News.